Okay, welcome everybody uh, to the SEPTN seminar. Today it's our great uh, pleasure to welcome Jonas Haferkamp from the University of Berlin. And uh, Jonas will talk about uh, linear growth of quantum circuit complexity. So please take it away. Yeah, thanks a lot for the very kind introduction and also thanks to the organizers for the invitation and for making this happen. Um, as it was announced, I'm going to talk about the growth of circuit complexity in random quantum circuits. I was lucky enough to work with the following group of people. So this is Philippe uh, Feist, uh, Naga Kutakonda, Jens Eisert, and Nicole Junger Halpern, who also worked on this project. Um, we published this uh, as a preprint, or yeah, we uploaded it to the archive, and you can find it under this identifier. But of course, you can also probably just Google the title and that's easier to find. So having said this, uh, maybe we just dive right in and start with the concept of uh, quantum complexity. Quantum complexity really is a ubiquitous concept in quantum information uh, theory and already very, very well established. This is actually not very surprising because it answers a fundamental question that might be of interest for almost everyone working with quantum operations, namely, is my operation hard to um, implement versus easy to implement? This is very general. And as well, this is also um, what works for um, how it works for classical systems and the classical analog of quantum circuit complexity. It really became one of the notorious bad boys of like uh, computer science since the 90s. The problem with this is that lower bounding uh, classical computer complexity is related to um, to the separation of complexity classes and therefore notoriously hard. It already plays a vivid role in physics. So for example, it makes a surprise appearance in condensed matter in the definition of topological phases of matter. So here, for example, a state can be defined to be in the topological phase if you cannot prepare it with constant depth circuit. So in order to prove that some state is in a topological phase, you would have to prove circuit lower bounds. And of particular importance for this talk, or at least for the motivation of the results in this talk, um, is the application in the ads cft correspondence, where the circuit complexity is conjectured to correspond to properties of uh, regions and black holes beyond the uh, event horizon. So when I talk about circuit complexity, what am I thinking about? So here we I have a specific model in mind or a specific quantity in mind. In particular, we want to deal with the exact implementation complexity of a given unitary. And maybe this is a good point for me to point out that uh, while I'm going to talk about unitaries the entire time, everything here can be formulated uh, for states as well. And the statements that we obtain will be just minor, uh, uh, minor adjustments. So every global unitary can be decomposed into two local gates. This is sort of a folklore result in quantum information theory. And you can find, for example, a proof in Nielsen and Schwank's book. So you require at least four to the n times polynomially many uh, two local gates to implement any unitary. But of course, this decomposition is highly non-unique. In fact, you can find an infinite number of decompositions for an arbitrary unitary. So for example, the identity can be decomposed or written as a circuit by taking any circuit and then concatenating that circuit with its own inverse. And from all of these decompositions, we are interested in the minimal number of gates that is required, because there we actually know that it's a finite number. And this minimal number of gates that we require is what we call the quantum circuit complexity of the unitary. So this quantity, I mean, I hinted at it already, is going to be extremely difficult to feel, to estimate, or even to bound. Uh, I, I pointed out the classical notion is famous for being difficult to compute, since it's related to uh, the separation of complexity classes. And similar things can be expected for the complexity of states or the complexity of unitaries. So, if I cannot say anything about circuit complexity, then what is this talking about, right? And the question that we want to ask here is, 
even if it's hard to compute in a specific case. And again, this is really much expected because it seems like the only thing that you can do is list of all possible decompositions and then pick the minimal one. And there might be a gigantic number of decompositions with less than four to the n many gates. Um, even if it's for a specific state or a specific system, extremely difficult to say something about the circuit complexity. Can we say something about the behavior of complexity in typical systems? So is, for example, very large complexity something that I expect in typical systems to appear? If I take a look at my coffee mug, then is this a highly complex state or is a large complexity something extremely exotic that would only rarely exist? And there is a conjecture on uh, how complexity behaves in typical local or interacting dynamics. And it's due to uh, Brown and Susskind. And they conjecture the following, namely that actually complexity keeps on growing until it saturates after an exponentially long time. And I think we really expect that this growth of complexity phenomenon is something that's really universal in quantum many body systems. So similar to, for example, thermalization or operator growth or growth of entanglement, you would expect that the complexity grows with time. The crucial point here is that they conjecture that this holds for an exponentially long time. So uh, in fact, thermalization or scrambling would take uh, place much earlier. Um, I talked a lot about um, local dynamics, and before I want to talk about this conjecture and why we believe that it's true, let me briefly uh, explain what I mean when I talk about uh, local dynamics. And in fact, we have a specific model of local dynamics in mind. There's actually lots of different possibilities of, of modeling this. One possibility would be, for example, taking a local Hamiltonian and considering the time evolution of this Hamiltonian. This is what we could call an analog, uh, analog system. But here we have a digital system in mind, uh, which is called random quantum circuits. And in a random quantum circuit, I take some arrangement of the gates, some previously fixed arrangement, and then I pick the states uniformly from the unitary group on two qubits. And here I use a very fancy word, it's called the Haar measure on this group. But for everyone who doesn't know what this is, it's really just a straightforward generalization of drawing uniformly from, a, from an interval, for example. So it is really, it can be rightfully called the uniform measure on this unitary group. We do this locally for every gate, and then we contract along the architecture or the arrangement that we previously picked. So this was, for example, um, also proposed to consider in this paper by Van Dao, Chemisani, Hunter Jones, King, and Preskill. And uh, this really, I, I just want to point out that this is really what got me interested, at least in working on this problem. And later I'm going to talk about what they prove. They actually prove some very interesting um, complementary results to ours. Because now is as good a time as any basically to introduce this notion and we are going to need it. I want to point out that all of our results or our result basically holds for many different architectures, but they need to have a certain property. And this property is a kind of connectedness property. In fact, we require that our circuit architecture can be um, can be decomposed into sections, each of which has sort of a complete backwards light cone. And the intuition behind this is that it's not very surprising that we require the circuits to be very connected for growth of complexity. Um, because if you, for example, consider a circuit that only applies to the first two qubits gates, then the gate complexity will always stay one, for example, or if it stays in subgroups on the unitary group. And we would never expect the circuit complexity to grow beyond polynomial times, for example. So we definitely need something like this, which is, I guess, the prototypical example of a circuit architecture. It's called brickwork for obvious reasons. But you could also imagine something like the staircase architecture. And this complete backward light cone, which is essentially the property that you have some qubits, such that every qubit can be connected via gates, via paths leading through gates, to this qubit, this property is what we call causal. 
So we want to have a circuit architecture that you can decompose into um, uh, into slices that are each, each of which are causal. And I should say we display here two local gates that are nearest neighbor, but of course that's not necessary. That's mostly to uh, make it look prettier. So we also allow for some non-local architectures or all to all interactions. So after this brief uh, intermezzo, let's go back to this conjecture, this linear growth of entanglement, and let's take a look at why we believe that this is true, why people believe why, that this is true. And the first part of the conjecture is really the linear growth for a very long time. And the linear growth in the beginning is not very surprising. And the idea here is that the unitary group is a vast space. It's four to the n dimensional or four to the n minus one if you take the special uh, unitary group. And random quantum circuits make up a tiny subset, at least in early times, they make up a tiny subset of these unitaries. So you would expect that if you add gates, then new space is explored every time you add gates. And so you could expect that the circuit complexity sort of keeps growing with this, uh, with this exploring of new space in the unitary group or in the state space for states. Then for very early times, for sort of linear times, there are actually arguments that I think are mostly folklore or have been around for quite some time, that the entanglement actually grows linearly. And in a very general sense, complexity is sort of a measure of entanglement. If you think about it, entanglement sort of measures or multipartite entanglement sort of measures how difficult it is uh, for an agent, for example, to turn your state into a product state or for how different your state is from a product state. And complexity really measures precisely that. In fact, it, uh, it measures the amount of resources that you actually need to turn your state exactly into a product state. And since we know that the ent uh, entanglement entropy or other notions of entropy actually keep growing in random circuits linearly until they saturate after some time, we could simply expect that complexity is the actual measure of entanglement that keeps growing after these entropies are saturated, after the scrambling or thermalization time. Then a third point where we believe in linear growth or why many people believe in linear growth is something that I think many people in the audience know much more about than I do, but it was definitely part of the original motivation that led to this conjecture. And it's the so-called wormhole growth paradox in the ADS-CFT correspondence. Here you have the ADS-CFT correspondence, which is this conjecture dictionary between quantities in gravity or an anti desitter space on the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, conformal field theory, which is a quantum theory on the boundary. And in particular, uh, this led to something that people believed to be a paradox, which is the fact that the, the volume of some regions and wormholes keep growing steadily at a linear rate for exponentially long times. But on the other hand, in a quantum theory, local observables tend to equilibrate ex uh, or tend to thermalize extremely quickly, meaning that they do not change uh, much after sort of a polynomially long time. And this led in particular Susskind to conjecture that um, the volume of a wormhole on the CFT side does not correspond actually to a local observable, but in fact to some global property of the state. And he conjectured this to be the, um, the complexity of the state, which looked in various examples like it would grow linearly for a long time. The saturation part of the conjecture is actually much less speculative than the linear growth part, because definitely growth is uh, something that we expect, but linear, the rate being linear, meaning that it's actually sort of maximal, um, this is absolutely not clear, I think, or at least it was not clear. The saturation part, on the other hand, I think it's not very surprising if you believe in the linear growth, because we know that every unitary can be implemented with something that scales like four to the n many gates, so we know that the circuit complexity simply cannot keep growing after a certain point or after some exponentially long time. And this is crucial, really. We know that most unitaries are, in fact, extremely complex. 
And this is also a folklore argument that you can find, for example, in Nielsen and Chuang. And there are various different arguments for why this is true. And for our notion of circuit complexity, this actually follows extremely easily and intuitively. Namely, the, it just follows from the fact that the unitary group on n qubits is of dimension four to the n minus one, which is gigantic. But a circuit with R gates has very few parameters if R is not exponentially long. So if most unitaries are very complex, then once we've hit this threshold of basically describing every possible unitary, it is very unlikely that by adding new gates, we end up in one of these very rare low complexity unitaries. And the idea here is really just that if a, part, if a given circuit or if all circuits in a given architecture have uh, only 15 times R many parameters, 15 being the dimension of SU4, or at most that many different parameters, then of course the dimension, or this we believe, the dimension of the set of unitaries generated like this should also be at most of that dimension. And this argument is actually one, the, the very beginning or the cornerstone of our theorem, namely the idea behind our theorem is really just, can this argument be refined to encompass the case where we not compare all unitaries to the set of unitaries generated by small circuits, but instead compare the set of all unitaries generated by some longer circuit versus the set of unitaries that are generated by some smaller circuit. And this actually led us to prove the following theory. So here it is, right? Here, here the, uh, here's the theorem. We draw some unitary from a random quantum circuit in some architecture, and we assume that it has this causality property. And I should say, if you didn't get what the causality property is, then it's absolutely fine. You can just think about the brickwork architecture. Uh, and I'm going to point out the bound that we get for the brickwork architecture soon enough. So the idea is we have T causal slices, uh, each of which has L gates and the total number of gates is R. Then we get a lower bound that looks like T divided by nine minus N over three. And this is definitely linear in T, of course. And this actually seems to hold with probability one and until the, the number of slices actually meets this dimension threshold of the unitary group. So there's a couple of things that is remarkable, I think. And the first one is really that this holds with probability one. So it happens almost always. The set of unitaries that have low complexity really form a measure zero subset. And in particular, this means that the theorem also holds if we don't draw, for example, from the Ka measure on the unitary group, but also from some deformed measure. And the same theorem will hold. And in fact, this is something that we are going to use in a in an upcoming uh, paper. The other thing is that it not only holds until an exponentially long time, but in fact, for it, uh, it holds until a time that is essentially maximal, because we know that for something that scales like four to the n, we definitely can implement any unitary. So this is really essentially the maximal circuit complexity that you get, at least up to scaling. And Conjectured was only that it holds up to some exponentially long time. The other one is the architecture aspect. So for example, this encompasses the case where we have the brickwork architecture and we can choose causal slices to consist of n squared many gates, which in fact gives us this very explicit bound where the uh, rate of growth is actually inverse polynomial. And I can say something later about the inverse polynomial growth here, because this is actually one of our open questions, whether this can be improved to constant. But this is really only one example of this very general statement. And in fact, our theory seems to hold for many different architectures. And in fact, we can even use this theorem to prove that it holds for most architectures. So this is something that I find extremely interesting. Basically, if you consider nearest neighbor gates and pick the positions at random. So you not only draw random gates in a fixed architecture, but in each step, you also draw the pair of qubits that you apply the gate to at random. If you do this and then take the joint probability measure that is generated by this, then the probability of getting a linear lower bound with some 
inverse polynomial growth rate for the complexity is actually overwhelmingly close to one, meaning that it's uh, exponentially close to one in the system size. And here's the number of qubits. So this is, this is the theorem. This is one of the consequences, at least. And so for the rest of the talk, we're going to be very ambitious, I think. And I try to give you an overview of the proof and hopefully also some of the details of how we prove this. The idea really is um, to shift this viewpoint from what is called Nielsen's complexity. I, maybe I should, um, should explain this for a second. So the, um, so one of the very early approaches or many of the uh, papers that form, for example, this intuition, they use Nielsen's approach to, uh, to complexity to lower bound the circuit complexity or are interested in Nielsen complexity as a quantity in itself. And uh, Nielsen's complexity is sort of a differential geometry or Riemannian geometry way of thinking about circuit complexity. And here, by uh, considering the original notion of circuit complexity or a more traditional notion, we, uh, we lose something, namely the differential geometry viewpoint, but instead we also gain something. And this is what I'm going to explain soon. In fact, we gain the... Um, we gain the tools of semi-algebraic geometry. And to utilize these tools, we view the set of unitaries that we eventually want to compare as the image of a smooth map. So in fact, for a given architecture, namely for a given way to arrange the gates, we view the random, we, or we view the quantum circuit as a smooth contraction map from the set of gates, namely SU4 to the R, to the unitary group. And here in the unitary group, this forms some image set that describes all the unitaries that can be contracted uh, as one of these circuits. And in this picture, you already see, this is sort of a union of uh, spheres and uh, something that looks like a tube and is sort of a collection of manifolds. And of course, this is a simplification because we cannot envision this. These are extremely high dimensional spaces. But this captures something that's going to be extremely interesting for us, or at least to me. And in fact, what we want to know, of course, is if we want to compare dimensions of different sets of unitaries uh, for different architectures, we first need to make precise what we mean by the dimension of U of A. And an obvious first problem is that dimensions are usually defined for manifolds, and the, um, the image of a smooth map is not necessarily a manifold. So it might be something entirely uh, different. And in our case, this is all made much simpler because of the so-called tarski seidenberg principle. And I know that this might look technical, but uh, for, for us, it was really um, an important point because the first version of the proof that we came up with, it really worked with the Hausdorff dimension, which is defined for all states and the proof was much more complicated. But the task is in principle, it allows us to show that this is actually a so-called semi-algebraic set. And I should explain this. An algebraic set is basically just the solutions of polynomial equations. And it's not hard to see that this is true for the unitary group. So the unitary group is the solution set of the polynomial equations u times u dagger equals the identity and the determinant of u equals one. It's easy to see that all of these are polynomial in the entries of u, or at least of the real numbers uh, in the coefficients, uh, matrix coefficients of u. And the tarski seiden principle, it tells us that if you have the image of a polynomial map, uh, of some algebraic set or semi-algebraic set, it's again semi-algebraic. And semi-algebraic means that it's not just a set of solutions of polynomial equations, but also that you have to use inequalities. And the in most interesting thing for us for these sets is that you can always decompose them into a finite unit of manifolds and the highest dimension in this decomposition is independent of the decomposition. So we can just define this highest dimension to be the dimension of our image set. And I think it's best if I just try to explain this principle in an extremely simple example. 
So you see that it's actually not, not, not black magic at all, but actually something that you would expect from real world examples. And this example is sort of prototypical example of uh, algebraic sets, namely the sphere, which is defined by a simple polynomial equation, which is x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals one. And then you apply a polynomial map to the sphere. And this polynomial map just sends the z coordinate to zero. So it sort of compresses the sphere to the xy plane. And now the new set is a disk with boundary. And you see immediately that it's not a manifold anymore because it has this one dimensional boundary. But on the other hand, it can again be described by a set of polynomial equations and polynomial inequalities. So in fact, here we have z equals zero and the disk inequality, namely that x squared plus y squared is smaller than one. And you immediately see that it can be decomposed into a finite union of manifolds, namely the disk without the boundary and the boundary. The boundary being one dimensional and the disk being two dimensional. And then we can say, okay, the dimension of this set is going to be two dimensional. So this is an extremely simple example, but essentially uh, the properties that we are going to need from the set of unitaries that you can get from a given architecture is very similar to this, this uh, simple toy example of a projected sphere. I'm going to explain some further technicalities on why uh, this works and, and how we use sort of uh, elementary algebraic geometry and sort of to motivate this, let me just say that we gained something by this. And what we obtained is we took this very, very complicated quantity, the sort of mythological creature that is the circuit complexity of a given unitary. And that definitely requires Herculean strength to struggle with strength that I definitely do not possess. And we exchanged it for something that is much more well-behaved. And what we got is we got a quantity that cannot be assigned to a given single circuit, but only to the set of all circuits or all unitaries that can be obtained from the contraction of circuits in a given architecture. So it's a much more coarse quantity, but it's much easier to work with. And now I'm going to explain why I think it's easier to work with. So the first lemma that I want to talk about, or basically the only lemma that I want to talk about is a sort of all is well lemma. It tells us that this idea of comparing dimensions of circuits of different lengths might just work basically. So this lemma, it tells us if for some architecture A prime and some different architecture A, they have strictly different dimensions and the dimension for A prime is strictly smaller. Then if I consider a random circuit in the architecture A, the probability of hitting any unitary in A prime is actually zero. And this is really precisely what we would expect also from our very first example of comparing the set of all unitaries to sort of the set of circuits. But uh, I can, for example, construct smooth maps or even polynomial maps for which this doesn't hold. And we had to use some properties uh, of the unitary group to make this work, in fact. And here's sort of the, the argument in a nutshell. First of all, we try to make everything local, as local as possible. And to do this, we need to use some algebraic geometry. And the point seems to be that, and bear with me for a second, right? <laughs> um, the set of all points where this smooth map has low rank is characterized by the vanishing of certain determinants. And these are polynomial equations. So they are additional constraints on the set of points. And we can use the, the some properties of the unitary group. In fact, that it's very well behaved uh, with regard to algebraic geometry to show that this implies that the set of points where the rank is low is actually lower dimensional. And in particular, the rest where the rank is maximal uh, it has to be almost everything. So it has to be an open set of H measure one. And for this open set of H measure one, we know that the rank is constant and therefore we can apply some standard theorem from differential topology to show that very much locally in almost all points, this contraction map is equivalent to its own derivative up to changes of the parameterization. So, and then to prove this lemma, for example, what we can do is we can prove this locally using the fact that we deal basically with a linear map 
And then we use the compactness of the unitary group to stitch these local statements together to a global one. And one thing that this implies, and this is really what I think in the end justifies uh, displaying this as a kitten, is that this implicitly also shows, uh, I mean, at least modulo some details that are necessary to make it rigorous. Uh, this implies that the dimension of these sets is basically the same as the maximal possible rank of all points for this contraction map. And let this sink in for a second. What does that mean? I've already shown you an easy way to obtain an upper bound on the dimension of U of A, namely of the set of unitaries contracted from a certain architecture. And it is just counting the number of parameters. And we have seen that this is linear and the number of gates. So we have an upper bound on the number of gates. If we also obtain a lower bound on the number of gates now, then we know that for architectures of uh, of this, um, of this, uh, sorry, for unitaries from this architecture, if we draw these at random, the um, the probability of hitting any unitary in one of these low gate architectures is zero, and by definition, any unitary with a low circuit complexity needs to be in the image of one of these contraction maps for a low gate architecture. So once we have proven a linear lower bound on the dimension of U of A, we have already proven the theory modulo some of these uh, sort of differential topology details. And now comes sort of a bit of magic, namely that this equals to the maximal rank allows us to obtain lower bounds rather easily really, because the maximal rank by definition can be lower bounded by the rank at any point. And the points are really just circuits. So what we have to construct now is any point any circuit which has a very large rank or a linearly lower bounded rank. And now let's get into the details of this and I try to explain for mostly the rest of the talk how uh, we actually uh, manage to construct this point basically. So the rank of a map is defined by the rank of a Jacobian. I hope some of you remember this uh, from sort of analysis classes, the Jacobian is essentially the generalization of the derivative for, uh, for maps that are not just between R and R, but for higher dimensional, between higher dimensional spaces. And essentially it is just in a given parameterization, the matrix that has as columns, the partial derivatives of the map. So basically it's a gigantic matrix and the columns of these are just the, uh, um, are just the, uh, partial derivatives of your map and the rank is just how many linearly independent vectors fit into these columns or in other words what's the dimension of the, the image of this uh, linear map and here the partial derivatives take a particularly simple form in fact so how do you take a partial derivative one possibility for example is to uh, perturb your object slightly in some direction uh, for some parameters, and then to consider the first um, the first term of the Taylor expansion. So in our case, the local parameters are the gates, and we can perturb this by multiplying it with something that's extremely close to the identity. And for unitaries that are close to the identity, they can be uniquely described by the exponential of some Hermitian matrix. And the Hermitian matrices on two qubits are just uh, spanned by the Pauli operators. So by tensor products of X, Y, and Z and the identity. The global identity here, here we actually don't have because we have the special unitary group, but that doesn't matter for us. So what could we do to obtain these partial derivatives that we are interested in? We take all of these possible perturbations, consider the first order expansions and the Taylor expansion, and uh, take a look at how these look like. And in fact, it turns out if we take the partial derivatives after these parameters or in the direction of these parameters, what this uh, amounts to is just to insert Pauli operators after your gates. So to reiterate, what we have to show is we have to show that the span of these partial derivatives and the partial derivatives is really just inserting Pauli operators after gates somewhere in the circuit. From all of these constellations to span that this is lower bounded linearly in the number of gates for some circuit. 
for, for any circuit. Like the architecture, of course, is fixed, but the gates that we can choose, uh, they are arbitrary, essentially. Because any point lower bounds the maximal rank, which is equal to the dimension. And we only need a lower bound at this point. So how can we deal with this? How can we compare different matrices if they are inserted at various different points in the circuit? Well, one way to do this is to, for example, to commute them through the circuit uh, to the right or to the left and then compare the resulting matrices. So this amounts to conjugating uh, the Pauli operators with the part of the circuit that's at the, to, to the right of them. So in this example, for example, we could move these Pauli operators to the right, and but then we have to would, we would have to conjugate them by these two gates, and this of course leaves us with something that's not too local anymore. And I just see that it's a bit unfortunate that this looks like these are single qubit Paulis because here I still assume that this might be an arbitrary unitary circuit. In fact, this leads me to the next point, which is let's make everything a little bit simpler because we only need some point and then maybe it's the easiest to deal with the less the, the least complex uh, uh, hermitian matrices that we get out of this that we get out of here and this we could do where a start would be just to consider unitaries that map Pauli operators to other Pauli operators in particular because comparing Pauli operators is really simple if Pauli operators are different, then if you have a set of n different Pauli operators, then you have, um, then they span an n dimensional space because the Pauli operators are an orthonormal basis of the Hermitian matrices. But that means if we really want to do this, I want to use this simplification, then we have to restrict our attention to so called Clifford gates. The Clifford group is really exactly this it's by definition the group of unitaries that map Pauli operators to Pauli operators. So we, uh, we pay attention only in the following to Clifford unitaries. And in fact, we construct a Clifford circuit that uh, is going to turn out to have a linearly lower bounded uh, rank and therefore the dimension will be linearly lower bounded. So here we define now inductively such a Clifford circuit. And for this, I need you to bear with me through this, uh, through this property that a causal slice has. Namely, the property is that we can take any Pauli operator and we can, given the Pauli operator, construct a fine-tuned Clifford circuit that sort of maps this Pauli operator to a single qubit Z operator on the right. And this is actually not very surprising because we have, for example, here, um, uh, we could take here any two qubit Pauli operator. And if it's not the identity on both qubits, then we can rotate this to the identity Z because the Pauli group, uh, it turns out, is completely mixed by the Clifford group. Namely, every Pauli operator can be generated from every non-trivial Pauli operator. And we can keep repeating this until we successively end up with a single qubit Pauli. And now the thing that you need to notice is this is a Pauli operated, uh, operator inserted into the circuit after some gate. So this definitely qualifies as one of the partial derivatives that I talked about before. So this is actually in the span of the Jacobian now. In other words, we can always for any given Pauli operator construct a Clifford circuit such that multiplying the circuit from the right suddenly uh, includes this Pauli operator in the span of the Jacobian for this contraction map. And this we use to, to inductively uh, construct the Clifford circuit. So assume that we already have uh, a Clifford circuit of sort of T prime causal slices. And we obtained as a result, a bunch of partial derivatives. So in other words, a bunch of Pauli operators multiplied from the right to the circuit that are all linearly independent. Now we pick any Pauli string that is not in this span as anyone, but it doesn't matter really, and construct the corresponding Clifford circuit such that now it's in the span. And therefore, since we can always do this, we can always, by augmenting the causal uh, slice by a sink, by, sorry, by augmenting the circuit by a causal slice, increase the rank of the Jacobian by one. And this is essentially already the proof. 
because this tells us that we have a lower bound of t for a circuit containing t causal slices, which is linear in the number of gates. And therefore, we have a dimension that is lower bounded linearly in the number of gates. And that means that all unitaries, the set of all unitaries with the lower gate complexity or less than linear gate complexity is a set of lower dimension. And our lemma tells us, our all is well lemma tells us that that actually means that hitting any of these unitaries by drawing randomly from this larger circuit um, uh, unitaries is, is of probability zero. So I hope that this gives you like some idea of how we prove this um, modulo some borrowing details to make it rigorous. Um, of course, I think about this result as sort of a minimal version of what Brown and Suskin conjectured. We prove it for an exact notion of circuit complexity, for example, and a big open question for me at least would be to prove this for a more operational version of the result. And in fact, we actually have a partial result here, but I should say that it's really underwhelming. So for example, uh, so, so what we prove is uh, we can lift this to a notion of quantum circuit complexity uh, that is robust to uh, some implementation error, but for some error that is uncontrollably small in the system size. So we know that it's strictly positive, like there's some strictly positive epsilon um, for which this linear growth still holds, even if we allow in our notion of circuit complexity for some implementation error. The problem is that we don't know how this scales. And of course, we believe that this works for some reasonable epsilon, but uh, at this point, we cannot rule out that it scales like inverse triple exponentially or something even worse. Luckily, we kind of have an idea of what we would need to understand to lift our result to a more robust notion. And in particular, what we would have to understand is um, how curved these spaces are essentially. Because it turns out the error really corresponds to um, how the volume of the set grows if we thicken these, these sets of generated unitaries by some epsilon. And it turns out that if you have an extremely curved space that's all over the place and thicken it by some tiny epsilon and getting like the tube around the set uh, gives you a gigantic volume suddenly. So we would have to keep the epsilon small. And figuring this out in detail, it seems to be a daunting task, but at least we have some idea of what we would need to understand. There's a completely different approach that I want to talk about a little bit here is uh, to actually try to prove that random unitary circuits uh, generate unitary designs in depth that is linear in N and T. Well, for, you don't need to know what T design is, basically just means uh, that it's, uh, it has properties closer and closer to the unitary group, but it mimics more properties of the unitary group as uh, the depth increases. And in this paper by Brandao, Chemisani, Hunter, Jones, Kung, and Preskill, they not only introduce a new notion of quantum circuit complexity, which uh, measures how distinguishable a state is from the maximally mixed state given a certain number of uh, unitaries, of two local unitaries. They also show that if you have a unitary design, then in fact, you get, um, you get lower bounds on this quantum circuit complexity as well. And I should say, to be fair, that this is a much more sophisticated notion of quantum circuit complexity. So, um, I would really like to see this result. I think it would be an extremely profound statement. And uh, this is also something that we definitely have in mind. On the other hand, uh, I told you that we chose a model um, of local dynamics, which is random circuits. And we definitely got something from random circuits. I mean, that it's a neat model, which is digital. And uh, we sort of have, we were sort of able to keep adding degrees of freedom. But of course, this is something that you don't have for a fixed Hamiltonian or uh, at, even for an ensemble of local Hamiltonians, because during the time evolution, you do not keep adding degrees of freedom. So in order to prove this for the time evolution of some fixed time independent Hamiltonian, or even for the thermophile double state, which seems to be the crucial state in this um, wormhole growth paradox, there's a lot of evidence for at least super polynomial 
um, complexity, not necessarily for linear growth, but all of which is essentially based on some complexity theoretic assumptions, which is fine, of course, but uh, proving this really uh, without any assumptions rigorously, I think it might, might well be beyond the methods that exist right now. And then one last thing that I would like to do, for example, is to look for better constructions of circles with high rank or even to upper bound the dimension uh, better, because any bound in any direction essentially improves our, our statement as well. So, for example, it would be interesting whether you can get rid of this, uh, this inverse polynomial growth rate. So make it, for example, constant and independent of the system size. I would like to see that. Um, even though I should say, for example, in, in this result, you also get this one over n factor. So it might be the case that this is actually optimal, one over n. So I think I'll stop here. And I thank you a lot for your attention. And I would be happy to answer questions if there are any. Uh, thank you very much for this very clear talk. And yeah, we are happy for the audience to have questions. Hi, Jonas. Thanks for this uh, Hi. great talk. Um, I, I have a pretty naive question. So um, I, I didn't get the full proof. Um, I appreciate that you <laughs> tried to convey it. But um, um, could you perhaps say again why? Um, so I, I got the story with the lower bound and the ability to pick a um, particular circuit, which is quite kind of cool. Mm -hmm. um, but how exactly does this, so, so where's the point where this no longer um, applies um, if you reach times that are on, in the order of exponentially in, in N? Ah. The point is really in this inductive construction from this point to this point. And here, what we do is in this inductive construction, we sort of assume that we have a set of Pauli operators and they are all mutually different. And we have like T prime many Pauli operators in the set. And then we pick any Pauli operator that is not in the set. And the point is simply that after four to the n minus one many slices, we have a set of four to the n minus one Pauli operators, Pauli strings, and that is just a set of all Pauli strings, and there is no Pauli operator to pick anymore. So we cannot keep adding degrees of freedom. That's the that's the entire point. I, I mean, you nodded, but you were muted. <laughs> kind of obvious after you pointed it out. So. No, it's not obvious. It was very quick, of course. <laughs> Kim, will, let me ask. Um, so uh, I, I implicitly um, you, you commented on that, but uh, how, how general do you see uh, your, your uh, proof or um, um, are there underlying assumptions? Um, uh, so, uh, also even in a black hole context, um, uh, would you see that uh, there's a one to one correspondence or uh, for the quantum circuit picture? I'm not sure what you mean by one to one correspondence, but the proof is uh, certainly very much fine tuned to this random circuit ensemble. Um, this is also what I was trying to say in the very last point, basically. Um, well, of course, what we are interested in is this thermophile double state in the context of the wormhole growth paradox and also uh, just in the time evolution of the very specific Hamiltonians of chaotic Hamiltonians. And here the problem really is that as you go on in time, this, this keeps being a one dimensional curve, essentially, right? Like the time evolution in state space, it's just a one dimensional curve and it doesn't like generate this entire set. Um, and what we do here is we really compare we sort of do a counting argument. Essentially, we would like to compare volumes of sets, but since these are submanifolds, the, the proxy for volume that we can talk about is the dimension. And we use that we generate larger and larger sets, and um, we simply don't have this for any specific Hamiltonian or even for a local Hamilton, uh, ensemble of Hamiltons, because in the end, this will just be a polynomially large uh, space dimension wise. So I think it's very, very fine tuned to this. I have some hopes that the error tolerance can be improved, but I don't think it applies to something 
beyond random quantum circuits and definitely believe that to prove lower bounds on the complexity of the thermal field doubled state in particular requires completely new methods. And uh, do, do you think that uh, this could be um, a chance to go beyond the quantum circuit picture also in the in the continuum for like uh, quantum fields? So, um, um, ah, that's actually very interesting. I don't know about notions of quantum circuit complexity for general quantum field theories. Um, it's interesting, yeah. I never thought about this, to be honest. Uh, but I would love to know. I, I, I guess with uh, some uh, yeah, the, uh, the, this, uh, this path order exponentials that are they're also used in the QFT context for um, uh, complexity, so probably this could be could be also used in this, this context. I mean, if you uh, yeah, if you can point out any literature to me, I would love to read up about this. Sure, sure. Um, I had a question on sort of your proof techniques. Um, so I understood that you were trying to bound the uh, complexity of the unit trees by taking a look at solutions of uh, algebraic sets or varieties. Um, but do you think you were, uh, there is a correspondence between the proof techniques that you use from algebraic geometry and those uh, that are traditionally used to understand this sort of problem? Mm, what do you mean by traditional? Uh, um, sort of like the Nielsen complexity approach, like do you think you're, there is uh, like an equivalent set of techniques that could be used um, within that context to prove the brown soskin conjecture? Mm, I mean, I'm not sure about an equivalent set of, um, no, I, I don't think that there's something that's completely equivalent because in the end it's very different uh, kinds of math. But uh, of course, I mean, it's might be possible that comparing dimensions is also something that we could apply to Nielsen's complexity in principle, at least. Um, but this is something that we haven't done. Like, this is definitely something that we have in mind. Exploring connections to Nielsen's complexity. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, are there further questions? If that does not seem to be the case, then let's thank uh, uh, Jonas for this very nice talk and to have the chance, uh, feel free to unmute and uh, let's clap uh, so much later.